Okay, welcome everybody uh, to our very exciting next uh, CASA Distinguished Lecture. It's my great, great pleasure to introduce Elisa Redmiles, um, who recently joined um, Max Planck Institute for Software Systems in, in Saarbrücken. And she is one of the, the rising stars in this uh, exciting area of um, interdisciplinary research in, in cybersecurity. And um, as, as people know, and in, that's a very important topic in um, within CASA. Um, and uh, we have some, some excellent people already in Bochum, but we, are, uh, we, we had numerous discussion how to broaden our scope you know, look, uh, um, uh, look at different aspects, different notions of uh, interdisciplinary research. And I think Elisa is really a, one of the perfect go-to people for that topic. And yeah, we're all eagerly awaiting your presentation. Elisa, please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Gustav, for the very generous introduction. Um, so today I'd like to talk about how we make decisions. Um, and all of us have to make numerous decisions every day, um, including, you know, deciding what are we going to, you know, eat for lunch. And when we make those kinds of decisions, we can either look to ourselves as sort of the experts um, on what we should be eating for lunch, or we can look at those around us um, and see what, what is it that they're eating uh, and try to infer uh, perhaps the ideal lunch from their uh, preferences or behavior. Um, similarly, or more importantly than uh, lunchtime decisions, um, computational problems require constant decision making. So if we're building machine learning classifiers, we have to decide what features are fair to use or include um, when constructing those systems. Um, when we're creating security requirements, we have to decide what requirements to set, how stringent to make them, um, and how that will affect users. Uh, and typically, it's experts who set these best practices. So machine learning engineers or uh, security specialists or researchers who make these computational decisions. Um, and when experts make these decisions, they're trading off costs and benefits. Um, so one recent paper uh, had a long discussion about the scientist's decision um, about whether or not to release a data set that was used for uh, training a machine learning model. And the scientists discussed how they were trading off the benefit to science from releasing um, this data set against the risk to individuals in the data set that they could be re-identified um, if this data was released. And the scientists in this paper described their normative decision um, to trade off between the benefit to science and the risk to individuals in order to decide whether to release the data. Um, and we can imagine doing the same thing uh, for, say, building a new um, machine learning system where we might trade off against the benefits to the accuracy of the classifier against the unfairness of including certain features in that classifier. Uh, and finally, for security, we might trade off the um, improvement in protection of user accounts against the burden of, say, making users use two-factor authentication every time they log in. Um, and experts do not always agree on these trade-offs or what best practice is. Um, so if we look in the news or uh, even in our own lives as experts, we'll often see cases um, where experts are disagreeing or even having to revise um, the advice that they've given in the past. Perhaps more importantly, um, users and experts may disagree. So users' beliefs about the proper trade-off between the benefit to their security and the burden of logging into their account or the benefit to science of releasing a data set against the risk to people in that data set, users' beliefs may not necessarily line up with experts' um, decisions about what's best. Um, this disagreement is not something that has recently arisen because of the internet world, um, but it is actually a classic tension in moral philosophy. Uh, so going back to when philosophers were discussing how to set laws, um, how to make rules for a society, uh, they were discussing these two different approaches. Uh, and the two approaches were either a normative approach where experts prescribed laws or rules or best practices, or a descriptive approach where we learn from non-experts preferences and behavior and we infer what best practice should be based on what non-experts kind of already do or prefer. 
Um, and so in this talk, I would like to address the question of whether we can use descriptive approaches where we learn from users in computational decision making. Um, and the goal of using these descriptive approaches is to better align the technologies that we build with people's um, value system, their preferences, and ultimately make systems that both work better uh, and are more likely to be adopted. Um, so in particular, during today's talk, I'm going to address three different case studies using three different descriptive methods um, to see how descriptive approaches can help us with setting security policy, um, determining which features are fair to use in machine learning, um, and deciding what content should be permitted um, in virtual reality. So to, to start out, um, I'd like to take the, the security case study. Um, so in cybersecurity, our goal is often to get users to behave more securely. Um, and one of the ways that we try to get people to behave more securely is we prompt them to do so. Right. So many of us have seen a prompt that looks like this one. Um, this is Google's prompt trying to get people to use uh, two factor authentication or they call it two step verification um, where you sign up with your phone or um, a YubiKey, et cetera, uh, and you have to enter an extra code when you log in. Uh, and so most companies try to get people to do this by just sort of incessantly prompting them until they sign up. Uh, our question is, can we model how users respond to these prompts and optimize them based on people's natural behavior instead of sort of incessantly poking them. Uh, and the reason we want to do this is despite a whole history of us prompting users to behave more securely, they really don't do it. So the adoption rate of two-factor authentication, for example, at Google is less than 10%. And they've been prompting people for years and years and years. Um, so clearly kind of the approach that we're using is not working as well as we might like. Um, and when security experts think about why users don't behave as expected, why they don't adopt two-factor, even when we explain the benefits to them, even when we explain they have risk, um, one of the quotes that's often said is, the user is going to pick dancing pigs over security every time. So basically, people will do anything um, but do security. And in fact, a couple of summers ago, there was a um, little application for Instagram, um, where if you gave this application your Instagram password, it gave you some videos of dancing pigs um, and other animals that you could post. And of course, this was a phishing application. Um, so people were literally picking dancing pigs over security in that case. Um, so in order to evaluate whether people are really just sort of focused on dancing pigs, um, we wanted to try to um, model their behavior. Um, and in order to do that, we wanted to be able to conduct controlled experiments. Um, so typically in security research, we have sort of two options. We can either use um, in the wild log data where we look at how someone behaved, say, um, in some particular system, like let's say we have a collaboration with Google or something, we can see how they behaved. Um, this is great because it's really realistic, um, but the trouble is that there's only so many variables we can control, right? Even if we do A-B tests, we have no way to control, say, the value of someone's Google account to them. Um, so the alternative is usually to use um, online surveys where we say, imagine that you have this account and you see this prompt, how might you behave? Um, but the problem with that is that um, research, including my own, has shown that while surveys are useful um, for sort of telling you things about directionality, they're not great for like precisely modeling behavior, um, particularly in response to things like prompts, um, because there's just not quite enough incentive there for people to behave perfectly realistically. Um, so if we want to do some really controlled experiments to be able to figure out whether people are just like behaving randomly or if there's a pattern to their behavior, we're going to need to create um, a uh, artificial environment that's as realistic as possible, but where we can also control as many variables as possible. Um, so in order to do that, we built um, an online behavioral economic style experimentation system for security. Um, and in particular, what this system was, was a um, simple online bank account. And this big bank account held participants' um, study compensation, so how much they were going to be paid for the study. 
and the account had an explicit risk of being hacked. That is, we told people, here's your chance that your account will be hacked. Um, and if the account was hacked, which wasn't like a hacker, but was um, us running a random number generator, uh, if it was hacked, then they did, weren't paid for the study. So they lost all of their money. So there was a direct incentive. Um, and users were offered the opportunity to make a security choice. So for example, they could enable or not enable two-factor authentication. Um, just like in the real world, two-factor lowered the risk of hacking, and they were told how much it lowered that risk. Um, and two-factor increased the cost to complete the study in time and effort. And we were able to control the time it took for uh, the two-factor message to get to the user and, for example, whether it was the right code the first time so we could kind of vary frustration, things like that. Uh, participants actually stood to lose money, like I talked about before, um, and we used crowd workers, um, people who do small tasks um, in very quick time increments, so they'll get paid like five cents for doing um, a task that takes, you know, 30 seconds, or they'll get paid a dollar for doing a task that um, takes seven minutes. Um, and the reason we use these types of participants is because they earn money from small time increments, they can directly map their time spent, say, doing two-factor authentication to wages they lost from doing other tasks through the crowd working platform. So to give a little bit more detail, um, participants in our experiment create an account um, on our bank website. Um, they then learn their risk of uh, being hacked. So they're described to them the study, which uh, we said, you know, at the end of the study, you'll be compensated with the amount of money left in your study bank account. You begin the study with $5 in your bank account, um, which is the hourly wage of an MTurk worker uh, in the US. You must log in once a day, otherwise you lose all of the money in your account. Um, we did this so that if they signed up for two-factor authentication, um, they had sufficient annoyance um, and cost from using it by having to log in daily. If you're hacked, you will also lose all of the money in your account. Studies indicate that 20% of users will have their accounts hacked over the course of the study. Um, and we vary different parts of uh, this as part of our experiment. So we could vary the amount of money they uh, started with. For example, some people had $10 instead of $5, which would be two hours worth of wage. Um, other people began the study with $1, um, and every day they logged in, they earned an additional dollar. Um, this is to test uh, something economists call the endowment effect, where you care more about what you already have than what you're earning. Uh, we also, of course, varied the chance that people would be hacked, um, and this allows us to construct um, some controlled models where we can see whether people are behaving randomly, whether there's some kind of reasonable model to their behavior. Uh, finally, people were offered the opportunity to enable two-factor authentication, um, we used a phone-based two-factor because it was the easiest for us to control, um, and crowd workers were used to giving up their phone numbers for studies, so they didn't have um, any privacy concerns. We didn't, uh, you know, it's not the most secure two-factor, um, and of course there are privacy concerns, but for the purpose of this uh, experiment, it was sort of the best option. Um, in this particular case, the participant was told that two-factor would protect them from hacking 90% of the time. So they had a 20% risk of being hacked. If they enabled two factor, that dropped to 2%. Um, and at the end of the study, we had some questions to make sure that participants roughly understood um, the math that we were using. Uh, we again varied the amount of protection from two factor in our study. Um, and those who chose to enable it were um, put into a traditional like SMS based two factor. Um, and they had to use two-factor every time they logged into the experiment if they signed up for it, um, and they had to do that daily. Okay, um, perhaps not surprisingly, only about half of participants enabled two-factor authentication. Um, and this takes us back to our question of are half of people enabling two-factor because they're just flipping a coin? Um, or is there like a consistent pattern in why they're behaving the way that they are? Um, in order to answer that question, we wanted to model their choice to enable two-factor authentication as um, a function of a small number of the factors that we had in the experiment. Um, so first, we included the value of their account, for example, whether it was $5 or $10. 
um, the risks that they were told. So um, the amount of protection offered by two-factor as well as the risk that their account would be hacked. Um, and then a series of controls. Um, so password strength, which we measured with a pre-existing tool. Um, people weren't told that their password would affect the security of their account and it didn't, um, but people may have inferred that it might given that they've been told that password strength matters for security a lot in the past. Uh, we also included validated measures of their internet and security skill, um, as well as their demographics. Um, none of these controls were significant, uh, but the other two factors were. Um, once we uh, have these first two factors with account value and risk, we're able to explain um, a good portion of people's behavior, but not as much as we would like. Um, and in particular, uh, after we had built this initial model, we felt that we might be missing a few things. Um, and specifically, what we felt we were missing was a measure of the cost of doing two-factor authentication. Um, so it turns out that despite the fact that we tried to control um, the amount of time it would take people on our side, um, people with different levels of internet skill had uh, different costs from doing two-factor authentication, so it took them more or less time within a fairly wide range. Um, the other thing we wanted to include was past behavior. So either what they did in a prior round of our experiment um, or what they said they typically do when they're asked to enable two-factor authentication. Um, again, we had the controls, um, which weren't significant. Um, once we build this larger model, what we see is that our initial model with just risk and account value explains about 9% of the variance in people's behavior. Um, and a sort of good model of human behavior, so a model that uh, predicts like what people will do when they're shopping in the supermarket, um, will explain like 30 to 40% of behavior variance. So 9% is okay, but not nearly as good as we would like. Once we add costs um, to the risk and account value, so how long it takes people to do it, as well as the risk um, and the value of the account, now we're getting to a pretty good model. We explain like 26% of the variance in people's um, behavior. But once we add past behavior, so how they typically respond to two-factor um, prompts, plus the previous factors, we're able to explain 61% of the variance in people's behavior. And this is very high um, for a model of human behavior. What this tells us um, is that people aren't just sort of randomly flipping coins, right? So they're not just sort of randomly deciding whether or not to enable two-factor authentication, um, but that we can actually predict what they're going to do with a pretty small number of factors. Um, and when we look at the results of these models, we see that people are behaving in reasonable ways. When their account value is higher, um, they're more likely to enable two-factor. When their risk is lower, they're less likely to enable, et cetera. Um, and we're not arguing that if you went in the real world, you would necessarily be able to explain 61% of their behavior. Obviously, our experiments are very controlled. Um, but this does tell us that people's behavior is well-reasoned um, and is something that we can try to account for when we choose to prompt them or build security systems. Um, and so in particular, people's behavior is explainable. We can model it reasonably well. Um, we find that differences in ability, so differences in how long it's gonna take people to do two-factor authentication, alter what they choose to do, which is something we can try to account for. Um, and differences in account value also alter behavior. Um, and so the normative view of security says, let's just prompt everyone to do two-factor because it's good for them. And the problem, um, like I said at the beginning, is that people are so inundated, they start ignoring the prompts. And the other problem is not everyone is getting the same value out of the same behavior. So if it's a lot harder for me to do two-factor, then it's taking me way more time than somebody else. Um, and if I value my account a lot less, then I'm getting a lot less back um, from protecting it. So a descriptive view says, okay, let's learn from people's behavior, where now we know that there are inequities in their ability, in their valuation of their account, et cetera, and that that's influencing what they want to do. 
And we can distribute different prompts that are customized, say, to show up once someone's account has reached a certain level of value. In the case of a bank, this is pretty easy. In the case of like a social media company, um, you might think about at what point have users spent a certain amount of time on the platform, uploaded a certain amount of content, et cetera. Um, and we can think about allocating resources. Um, so things like YubiKeys that you plug in your computer and tap, which might be um, easier for particular users to use um, or might be effective for high risk users. So Google, for example, has a program where high risk journalists can get a YubiKey for free um, because it's especially important to protect those accounts. Um, so we used our kind of descriptive approaches to observe people's behavior through our experimental system, infer why they were making the decisions they were making and sort of what their preferences were. Um, but we haven't quite used that to make a decision, right? So I described how we could try to customize prompts, um, but let's make that a little bit more concrete. Uh, we can use a technique from game theory, which is called mechanism design, uh, which can allow us to um, put our descriptive approach into practice. Um, and in particular, we can try to construct a model of um, the system through which users get prompted for security behaviors. Uh, so in particular, we can imagine we have a set of users um, and we have a company. And the company has some different factors that they control. So they control um, what behaviors, security behaviors they offer to users, um, including like how costly those behaviors are going to be, um, as well as how much protection they're going to offer. So for example, there might be a couple of different uh, two-factor approaches they can offer people, some of which are faster or slower, and some of which are more or less secure. Um, the company also controls the messages or prompts that it shows users, both in terms of um, what the messages say, as well as when uh, the user is going to be prompted. Um, and the company controls what resources, like YubiKeys or a helpline, uh, they can offer their users. Um, now, if they use a descriptive approach, they can have a model of user's behavior um, where what the user chooses to do in terms of like whether or not they enable two-factor authentication depends on the user's level of skill, their value of the account, um, and how they've responded to two-factor authentication requests in the past. Um, using this model, the company can predict um, how the user is going to behave given some set of behaviors and prompts and resources they're offered. Uh, the user's behaviors are going to feed into a cost model because, of course, it costs the company um, resources to restore users' accounts or pay them back or et cetera uh, if they're hacked. Um, and it also costs the company some amount to offer these protective behaviors and resources. Um, of course, these costs feed into the company's profit model, as do uh, the profits from the users themselves, for example, through ad revenue um, or interests on their uh, bank balances. Um, this creates a cycle where the company can now try to optimize, say, their profit, um, given some constraints on budget and constraints on how good um, security behaviors can even be, um, where the, the company can try to optimize for a given user or type of user um, what it would make most sense to offer them, when they should prompt them, who they should give resources to. Um, this is useful because it allows us to, um, instead of treating all of the users the same, it allows us to create personalized messages um, and to distribute resources so that um, users are more able to do security and it's more fair. Um, and on the point of fairness, this kind of descriptive approach does allow us to introduce equity constraints. So we could say, well, um, a company can maximize their profit, but they also have to minimize the variance in um, the amount of cost for doing security between users. So basically, all users in the system should spend approximately equal time on security. Uh, or they could introduce um, the idea of risk equity. So saying things like, well, all users in the system should have as a similar of risk of having their accounts compromised as possible. Um, so once we kind of integrate the descriptive approach with still some normative um, work on, you know, what security behaviors to offer and what the portfolio should look like and what the minimum level of risks should be, et cetera, um, then we can also introduce 
uh, constraints that don't just help the companies, but also help users by making things more fair. Okay. Um, so we can, you know, solve sort of an optimization problem that uses our descriptive knowledge of user behavior um, in order to set security policies. In the next case study, um, I'd like to see if we can get a little bit closer to the decision. So in the last example, we had to kind of watch people's behavior, build that into a model, infer what we should do, and then set, uh, make decisions. Um, in the next case study, I'd like to talk about selecting features to use in machine learning and want to see whether we can eliminate the observing behavior step in this case and just kind of directly ask people their preferences um, about features that should be used. Um, and in particular, in this case study, we're going to talk about what features are fair to use in a classifier. Um, and we're going to take, again, a descriptive approach where we're going to model how people reason about fairness and then include or weight features in our classifier based on those fairness judgments. Um, and just like the last case study, before we do this, we of course wanna make sure um, that people actually are well-reasoned enough that we want to listen to their judgments. Um, so in the prior case, we wanted to make sure they weren't just sort of making random dancing pig choices. Uh, we want to, to make sure that's the case here as well. Um, but let's back up for a moment uh, before, before we dig into this. Why do we even care about whether it's fair to include particular features? Um, we care because users care. Um, and I'll give a brief example um, of why that matters. So um, a number of years ago now in 2015, uh, a news story came out about the fact that Google's algorithm um, was showing prestigious job ads for you know, very high paying jobs uh, to men, but not to women. Um, and when this news article came out, there was a large amount of outcry. Uh, and as part of um, that outcry, we were trying to understand what is it about this situation specifically that made people really upset. Um, and to answer that question, we wanted to understand like what drove their perceptions um, of the, the harm in this case. Um, and in order to evaluate that, we conducted a number of scenario surveys. Um, so we gave people a scenario very like the one that was going on in the news, um, and we varied different pieces of it, so this was sort of a controlled scenario, to understand um, when people's view in terms of how acceptable or unacceptable the scenario described started to change. So we told people uh, things like, Systemy is a local technology firm that develops software. They're expanding and they want to hire new employees. They contract with Bezo Media, an online advertising network, which places Systemy's job ad on a local news website. An HR employee at Systemy chooses to target individuals who are Asian rather than individuals who are white. As a result, the ad is shown more frequently to those who are Asian than those who are white. So some people receive this scenario, uh, while others received basically the same scenario, but with a different explanation for why the discrimination occurred. So in this case, people were told uh, Systemy, which is the tech firm hiring people, requested that their ad be shown to viewers who have recently visited technology interest websites. Those who are Asian tend to visit more technology interest websites than those who are white. As a result, the ad is shown more frequently to those who are Asian than those who are white. So in this case, the company requested um, their ad to be shown to particular viewers, and it happens that those viewers have a certain demographic, whereas in the prior case, an employee specifically asked to target individuals based on demographics. Uh, we had other variants. Um, for example, maybe the ad network charges less to reach those who are Asian than those who are white, and Systemy's um, computer program automatically selected the less expensive option. The result is the same, so on and so forth. Um, and so what we wanted to measure was the effect of varying the beneficiary. So was it a majority group or a minority group who was benefiting? The targeting mechanism. So was it a human or was it an algorithm? Um, and the targeted features, was it based on like clicks or cost or explicit demographics? Um, and in order to answer our questions about you know, what was driving people's perceptions of discrimination here, 
Um, we collected some training data on a crowdsourcing website where people took our survey. Um, we trained our regression models on that. Um, and then we collected a uh, larger census representative, so with demographics matching the US um, online survey panel, and did like five-fold cross-validation on our trained models, um, which fit well. Um, and what we find out from constructing these um, models on our survey data set is that features are a key factor of perceived fairness. So people, um, the main thing driving people's perception of fairness in these scenarios was whether um, the discrimination occurred because there was targeting done based on explicit demographics or based on people's like click patterns where there happened to be a demographic correlation. Um, so for example, here we can see uh, a much larger percentage of people um, who think it's a, a problem if there's explicit demographic targeting. Um, the mechanism of targeting, whether it was human or an algorithm, didn't matter. Um, and majority groups always perceived um, minority groups benefiting as less problematic. It didn't matter which minority group it was. Um, whereas minority groups find all of the scenarios more problematic than majority groups, regardless of whether their group was benefiting. Um, but the thing that's most important to us here for the nature of this talk is that features were a really important piece of people's perceptions of fairness. Um, and so because of this, we wanted to understand whether we could use people's judgments to help us um, build classifiers that would have features people perceived as more fair. Um, and we're gonna take a different uh, example scenario um, in this case, because there was never um, information released about how the, the Google uh, situation that happened with the job ads happened. Um, but a different situation that happened that caused a lot of outcry, uh, the features involved in the model were released. Um, and that was for the compass system. So the compass system is an algorithm that's been used in uh, Florida to help judges make decisions about which criminals to release on bail. Um, so basically the judge can decide that you have to pay a certain amount. Um, and if you pay this amount, you're allowed to go home while you wait for your trial. Um, and the idea is that you only release people on bail who are unlikely to commit another crime during the time where they're waiting for their trial. Um, and so this compass system, uh, the goal of it is to output a rating about someone's chance of recidivating, so committing another crime, um, and the judge can use that output to help them decide whether or not someone should get bail. Um, and there was a lot of outcry that happened when people found out about the system. Um, and part of the reason for that outcry was that um, the system was using a questionnaire as the way that it um, determined people's risk of recidivism. And that questionnaire included questions about the person's current um, charge, the criminal history of their family and friends, their performance in grade school, their mental health status, et cetera. Um, there was nothing legally sensitive. So unlike our last scenario, no race, no gender were explicitly used. Um, but people still had concerns about things like, for example, including people's performance in kindergarten um, as part of the prediction or including the criminal history of their family and friends, which they can't control um, in this type of algorithm. Um, and so these, uh, these um, features were input into the um, algorithm and uh, used in order to determine a chance of recidivism. Um, and we want to determine which of these people perceive as unfair. Um, and in a, in a traditional like um, legal system, judges are the ones who get to decide whether or not particular information or features are not fair. So they can decide that, for example, the criminal history of family and friends is irrelevant um, and they can kick it out. In the case of the compass system, um, it was the algorithm designers who got to select the features um, and opt use them to optimize for accuracy. Um, and they got to pick uh, which features were unfair to include. For example, they didn't include like race or gender. Um, we want to ask the question of what if uh, people, just like kind of a jury of your peers, were the ones who are allowed to determine uh, which features were unfair to use or at, which, at least which should be downweighted in this kind of algorithm. 
In order to do that, we need to make sure that people actually have some beliefs about the fairness of these features. We believe they do from our prior study, um, but we don't know for sure if they're going to be able to break down their feelings at a more nuanced level than just demographics versus not demographics. Um, so we again use a scenario based survey in order to assess people's beliefs. Um, so we tell them judges in Broward County, Florida have started using a computer program to help them decide which defendants can be released on bail before trial. The computer program they're using takes into account information about the defendants stability of employment and living situation. Um, and depending on the question, we varied um, what they were told in the bolded sentence uh, because there were 10 different types of compass features. Uh, for example, the computer program will take into account the defendant's answer to the following question. How often do you have trouble paying bills? Uh, people were then asked to uh, rate if it was fair to determine whether a person can be released on bail using information about their stability of their employment and living situation and they made this rating on a scale from one to seven. Um, we pre-tested these questions through what are called cognitive interviews, where people think aloud while they take the survey to make sure that they comprehended uh, the questions. And like in our other example, we used um, two different samples, but found that our, the findings were consistent across both samples. Uh, what we find is that people have different views about the fairness of different pieces of information being included in this classifier. So um, with seven being the most fair, we see that on average, people think it's very fair to include the person's current charges or their own criminal history in the classification. Um, the substance abuse and employment stability are sort of medium fairness, while including information about the quality of someone's social life um, their education and school record or the criminal history of their friends and family were generally considered quite unfair. Um, but although we find that people have views about whether these features are fair, um, we find that there's a lack of consensus in their beliefs. So it's not the case that sort of everyone feels the same way about the fairness of these different features, but it is the case that people have views about the fairness. Um, and this lack of consensus made us concerned because if we're trying to determine what features go in a classifier based on people's beliefs, um, we don't wanna sort of cherry pick which beliefs we follow. And it's also not clear if there's lack of consensus that going with sort of the average belief is going to be the right representation. So we wanted to dig in a little bit more and see if we could figure out why people are lacking consensus. Um, in order to do that, we wanted to break down fairness into a set of um, sort of sub questions. And we drew these sub questions from prior literature. So we looked at legal, philosophical, um, economic, et cetera, literature um, to figure out how experts had reasoned about fairness in the past. And what we saw was that fairness really decomposed into questions like, is this feature able to be reliably obsessed, assessed? Is this feature relevant to the decision at hand? Is this feature private? So in the case of kind of traditional legal, we would ask the question like, has, was there a warrant obtained to get this information? Um, does this feature cause, including this feature cause disparity in outcomes? Um, is this feature like highly correlated with membership in a sensitive group? Questions like this. Um, what we wanted to know was if we asked end users these types of questions and also asked them the fairness of using a particular feature, could we get from the answers to these sub questions to the feature fairness? And what we find is the answer is resoundingly yes. So we have 88% accuracy when we're predicting whether or not a given person will think that a feature is fair to use based on how they rate the feature. So um, a particular user um, who rates some particular feature as quite reliable, not at all relevant, relatively private and very volitional is going to have the same view about the fairness of using that feature as another user who had the same ratings on the eight properties. Um, but a user who had different ratings on those eight properties is going to reach a different belief about fairness. The reason this matters is that people were very consistent in their mapping from properties to fairness with that 88% accuracy. Um, but they were not very consistent in terms of how they rated the features. 
Um, so what this tells us is that descriptive work looking at um, lay user preferences is a really useful for finding the mapping function from the properties to the fairness. Um, but we need normative experts to evaluate the properties. So judges, um, economists, philosophers, et cetera, are well trained in evaluating these kinds of properties, but their individual judgment um, about how those properties match to fairness may not be as well representative as building a model based on a whole bunch of responses, um, which will end up being quite consistent, at least within a particular um, culture, in this case, the US. You know, ultimately in the future, we'd even love to be able to computationally evaluate some of these properties, particularly like causal properties that are hard for experts to evaluate. And we could imagine having a combined system where the properties that can be computationally evaluated are, experts make evaluations for those that cannot be computationally evaluated, and then a descriptive model helps us map from those properties to the fairness and determine what we might want to include in a classifier. Um, and in particular, um, I've pasted the, the paper here, uh, we use a very similar approach to uh, what I described in the last um, case study, where we use an optimization to have uh, fairness ratings determined by this user mapping function as constraints for trying to optimize accuracy in this type of a system. Okay. Um, so in the final brief case study, I want to talk about whether we can get to the decision even faster. In some cases, can we just work directly with users um, to establish our set of guidelines? Um, and I want to consider this question in the context of virtual reality. Um, so a couple of years ago, and even still now, uh, virtual reality was relatively uh, low in adoption. And so there were very few standards for uh, what should be happening in VR, what was an appropriate um, set of content, etc. cetera. Um, and so we had done an interview study with VR users and developers in 2017. Um, and we kept hearing from developers that they really needed guidelines or assistance. Um, so for example, one developer said, there's quite a big list of unknowns right now in terms of what's best etiquette for a user and what's going to keep the user the most safe, comfortable, and satisfied. And another developer said, well, the fact of the matter is there are no VR power users and I can count on the number of my hand, the number of experienced developers I've actually met. And our developer interview participants kept asking us if we could give them guidelines for how to keep people safe in VR and what they should be doing. Um, and we thought, well, it's not clear that we as researchers should be normatively setting uh, the rules here. Why don't we try to see if the developer community can kind of create that set of standards within um, as a very kind of extreme descriptive approach. And so what we did was we distilled six sort of high level principles um, that we thought made sense for ethical VR development based on both our interviews with developers and with users. And we invited uh, 11 online communities of VR developers to edit um, our draft set of principles. And this is what the document looked like in the midst of being edited. And so people had added new principles, they were revising our principles, they were uh, commenting to each other, et cetera. Um, in the one week that we did this experiment, the document got 1,000 views. Um, of those views, 245 were from people who were on um, a Google Docs platform that would allow them to actually edit the document. Of those, um, we had 40 unique contributions from 19 editors, um, and seven people shared the document, which um, literature on Wikipedia editing calls a uh, kind of lower profile um, engagement. And the engagement we saw was about equivalent to Wikipedia um, editing levels. And what we saw was that developers would go um, back and forth with each other, trying to kind of revise and create these principles. Um, and at the end of the week, the developers had reached consensus on 10 principles. Um, and I refer you to the paper for more analysis sort of on how they got to the consensus. Um, but what we saw was they ultimately had created um, a set of standards for ethical development. 
And following uh, this exercise, we saw developers creating libraries that addressed some of the, the points in the document um, or reaching out to others to see if they wanted to work on a particular, um, say, questionnaire for assessing the intensity of an experience. Um, and so this was kind of a different method, a very um, complete descriptive method uh, and very different than the first example I showed where we were simply kind of modeling and observing users. And so in general, um, different methods are appropriate for different kinds of problems. And there's sort of a continuum um, of descriptive approaches we might use in computational settings. Um, and these methods have prerequisites. So observation and asking users questions require consistency. Uh, we always want to make sure that users have um, well-grounded or at least modelable um, reasons behind the choices that we're making. Because if we're modeling noise um, and trying to take into account noise in our systems, we're not going to actually get anything um, better. This includes not just making sure there's consistency in a specific case study, um, but also making sure that we're using uh, good samples and rigorous methods. Uh, so a lot of my work also focuses on the epistemology, sort of the science of how do we do this well, um, especially in a computing setting. Um, you know, in the case of doing methods like co-design, There are also some normative choices we have to make, like recruiting um, co-design collaborators who you think will make good choices or recruiting a ton of people. So as an example, um, in the VR case, sometimes people ask me, well, why didn't you have VR end users co-design the standards too? Um, and part of the reason is that we as researchers normatively decided um, that end users at this time weren't going to be good kind of first round participants. Uh, and the reason for that was when we had interviewed users um, about safety and security in VR, they had said, well, you know, if you use VR, most likely you also use Reddit because there's a certain type of crowd that's really into this. And it's someone with a lot of money and who has a premium setup. Uh, and I'm not really concerned um, about anything, but I'll become more concerned once VR becomes accessible to the general public. Uh, and in general, we saw a lot of sentiment from users that was basically like, I want to protect VR by making sure that nobody else um, gets included or is welcome. Um, and as researchers, we decided, well, um, this is maybe not the, the group of people that we want kind of developing for a future of VR. And in fact, VR developers said the same thing. Um, but of course, that was sort of a normative choice by us as researchers to exclude a particular group from at least the first round of creating the ethical standards. So there's always a balance um, between descriptive and normative approaches. In the case of security, there's normative expert judgment about what um, you know, security behaviors are going to be effective for users and which to offer. Um, in the future, we hope we could maybe compute this effectiveness through measurement studies, but for right now, it's really just an expert judgment. Um, in the case of machine learning, um, right, we found that we need experts to be making judgments about the properties. Users just really weren't very good at assessing um, all of those eight sort of underlying properties. Um, and finally, in virtual reality, we as researchers made a judgment about who to include in the descriptive approach. And so there can be kind of an endlessly nesting set of descriptive normative trade-offs um, that we make when we're evaluating, you know, what, what are end users best at, what are experts best at, what are computing systems best at, and how do we integrate these together to design systems that work best for us as a society. Uh, so today we talked about how we can use descriptive solutions to help as a piece of solving various computational problems. Um, specifically in security prompting, um, determining the features to use in machine learning, and setting ethical guidelines for virtual reality. Um, and we talked about how we have to achieve different balances between normative and descriptive approaches. Thank you, and happy to take questions now.